and debate, influencing policies and supporting change. So since the onset of the pandemic in March 2020, TASC is increasingly partnering with frontline services to translate expert knowledge into actions for marginalized and vulnerable communities. And TASC work combines research, policy reporting and public dialogue at local and national government in order to improve the services. Task work supporting um, equality, social inclusion, climate justice and democracy is even more crucial as government and citizens begin to navigate the post pandemic world. Today, we continue with Task's conversation series, which is focused on decision makers in business and civil society. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Emily Pittman and will be focused on the topic of equity, diversity and inclusion. So Emily is the vice president and general manager uh, for Unilever here in Ireland. She is responsible for growing Unilever's business in Ireland, working in partnership with retail and wholesale customers. She leads the Irish sales, marketing and distribution teams. She, she succeeded Nick Johnson in October 2019 after joining Unilever in 2017 as part of the UK and Ireland executive team to lead revenue growth and strategic development. But prior to joining Unilever, Emily spent many years at Coca-Cola in st senior strategy roles. She also has experience in consulting and has worked with many CPG companies in the UK and Europe, delivering commercial transformation and delivering commercial transformation and operational changes. So I will ask Emily to take the floor now um, to share both the global Unilever view and some global local examples of the key learnings uh, from her experience of building a more diverse and inclusive business um, at um, Unilever. Uh, but before I do that, please just a reminder that with all the conversation series events, you we will be having a question and answer session uh, following Emily's remarks. So please do ask questions in the chat box. And thank you once again for joining us, Emily. Um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for your introduction. Um, it's always interesting when people introduce you because you think, gosh, have I really done all those things? But, um, look, it's led me to, to Ireland right here, right now. And I couldn't be more pleased to be uh, leading Unilever um, and also making sure we serve the Irish consumer, particularly as you referenced uh, through the pandemic. So look, thanks for having me. And I'm kind of talking a bit about my business that I'm in, but also in a massive area, um, which I'm really personally passionate about, which is equity, diversity and inclusion. So I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come and have a conversation today. So thank you. Um, so I suppose in the next sort of 15 minutes, what I do is share a bit about Unilever, uh, if you don't know who we are, uh, and in particular in Unilever Island, um, what our purpose is as a company and our goals and how that connects to, I suppose, the agenda that we're talking about today. Then what I'll do is I'll dig a bit into equity, diversity and inclusion in kind of six buckets or six points. Um, so we can just focus a bit on how to make a difference because it's, it's a massive agenda and a massive topic. So I'm trying to put it into some bite-sized chunks. So what we'll do is talk about taking bias out the system, how to be inclusive, not just diverse, because uh, I think we, we focus a lot on the diversity part, but we need to be inclusive as part of that to really make a difference. Really being better um, by being ready to unlearn. And I've definitely been doing a lot of that, so I can share some of my experiences. The importance of being external and, and, and partnerships, which is a bit like what we're talking about today um, in terms of with TAC. And then using brands to accelerate change. So thinking about what do you have in your business where you can actually demonstrate that you're living and breathing this um, right through everything you're doing in terms of making a change. And then a bit about the numbers we know. So yeah, that's how I'm going to spend the time with you today. So firstly, a bit about Unilever. So our business was established over 100 years ago, and we're one of the world's largest consumer goods companies. Uh, we're known for great brands. I'm sure many in your houses. Uh, we have a global footprint. And our belief is really doing business in the right way. And we are a truly global business. Our products are available in 190 countries, 190, one of those being Ireland. Um, and we serve 2.5 billion people with our products every day. Um, so you can see the impact that we have um, internationally and across the world. And in Ireland, we're the, one of the largest manufacturers. And we have a really deep and long history of serving the nation. 
with brands like Noor. I'm sure you're making some stews uh, in your house or getting your soups ready for the season. HB, which I'm sure brings a bit of joy to your families or a bit of ice cream in your life to bring some joy every day or definitely in the summer months. Purcell um, and, and Dove, which I'm sure everyone knows of, has had something in their shower or putting something under their armpits uh, through Dove. And look, our role is to continue to grow um, with purposeful brands that make a positive impact on society. And uh, we really look to our brands to really um, drive that in terms of the connection they can make with consumers um, while serving the, the needs of households. And actually, if you take a look around your house, I'm sure you'll find many of the everyday items you use come from Unilever. Just check the back of the packs and you'll probably find uh, the blue U there because actually we're in 98% of all Irish households. So um, that's just a bit about the business that I work for and in. And our purpose really as a company, um, which is guided by our strategic compass, is to make sustainable living commonplace, um, which is a kind of big, hairy, audacious goal, but so critical um, because we serve you know, multi-stakeholders, not just shareholders. And we've made some really bold commitments in three specific areas aligned to making significant social and planet, planet improvements. And the first is to improve the health of our planet, which I mean, look, there was a lot um, of discussion around that at the latest COP26. Um, the second is to improve people's health and well-being and confidence. Um, and look, confidence is, is a big part of Dove's um, social mission. And then the thirdly is to contribute to a, a real fair and inclusive world. Uh, and within that really sets our ambition to become a beacon for equity, diversity and inclusion within that. Um, and there's nothing as good as an external goal to really make that commitment real. So I think late, uh, I think it was about six months ago, underneath, underneath each of those um, pieces, we published our commitments, um, global commitments. And specifically in the equity, diversity and inclusion area, we published uh, five goals. So one is achieving an equitable and inclusive culture uh, by eliminating any bias, and I'll talk about bias in a minute, and discrimination in our practices and policies. The second is accelerating diverse representation at all levels of leadership. A 5% of our workforce will be made up with people with disabilities by 2025. To spend 2 billion annually with diverse businesses worldwide, because actually we've got a really broad ecosystem outside of just um, the people that we serve within our organization. And then also um, back to kind of what can you do inside your organization to the brands for us is, increasing representation of diverse groups in our advertising. So um, I'll talk about that in, in a minute about, but so really unstereotyping our alliances with um, companies that we work with um, so that we can make sure that we're showing up visually um, and in our products in, in a real represented way. Um, that's reflected the societies we live in. So we're really committed to building an inclusive culture where everyone are working at Unilever without exception feels able to bring their complete and authentic self to work. And we want all our employees uh, to thrive every day, irrespective of race, ability, sexual orientation or gender. Um, and so we've made a real um, big commitment to that. And look, it's, it's not like we've just started now. I think there's been a long history of making sure that that's a priority within our business. And actually to grow the best teams and future leaders and to serve shoppers with the best products, we need to build brands and teams that reflect the diversity of the world we live in. Otherwise, we won't be able to serve the needs of, of each and individual nations. And so, look, I'm not here to kind of uh, share with you the business case for diversity, equity and inclusion. But I suppose hopefully most of, the, most of you that are watching or listening um, know that it couldn't be clearer that if we get this right and we do represent the nations that we, we work in to the right level, um, we will have better financial outcomes, better innovation, better ideas, and empathy and an understanding for each other. Um, and, and I think that then builds a stronger culture and an impact in society, which we know we need to make. So look, that's a bit of the framing around the business um, and what we're doing. But what I wanted to do is kind of meet a bit of the business, what we're doing internally and my own experiences and bring those up, bring those together to really chunk up some lessons. So at least you can walk away today with uh, some, some ways in which you can make a difference or a bit of, um, you know, you're doing the right thing and do more of. Um, so I'll share a couple of stories on how I'm learning and unlearning uh, to really progress this agenda. So six of the areas that I'll talk a bit about. So the first one is about taking bias out of the system. 
The second is making um, an inclusive workplace, because I think we've had a lot of focus on creating a diverse workforce, but actually, if you don't get the inclusivity right, then you're only halfway there. Um, thirdly is being better, right? Getting ready to unlearn, get uncomfortable, having the conversations and addressing your own personal bias and, and allyship. Getting external, utilizing brands to accelerate change. Um, and then also about a bit like the numbers we know. So making sure that you try and understand where are you now so you can make um, systematic change in, into the outcomes that you're looking for. And that can, connects back to some of the goals that I mentioned earlier. So look, let me start by talking about how we're working to take bias out of the system. And look, I know me personally, I, I'm sure you will too, you'll have, I suppose, learned behaviors or bias that you've grown up with or the way that your life has shaped you where everyone, no matter you know, what their kind of social background is or how you're showing up today, there will be a set of bias um, that you inherently have. And also there's kind of, I suppose historical bias in some of the processes in that we have in our businesses. So really tackling them is really important. But if I think about the system and how you tackle bias in the system, one of the first things that we've done is to ensure that our recruitment process removes this as much as possible. So that for every process, we have a balanced, diverse slate of candidates. And actually, and as an example, in terms of gender, if you don't have two women as part of the, the slate in which you're going to interview, if you just have one, then what normally happens is that that person doesn't get through to the next round. It's just the facts and figures of it. So actually making sure that you've got that diverse slate of candidates um, from every type of background, I, I think is really important. Um, and so we've got a mechanism that checks that as part of our process. We also have, and I suppose that's when you're bringing single people in, but then also internally, we've also got sponsorship programs. Now there's a difference between sponsorship and mentorship. And this is really important. So again, when you bring diverse um, sets of um, people into the organization, that's different <laughs> from maybe how you've had it before. Sponsorship is key um, because actually what you want to do is make sure that people are representative, supported, um, so they, they get their progression um, through the organization. So there's two things that you, you can do straight away into your recruitment so that when you're bringing people in or looking to promote within, you're taking out those steps which may have created some bias um, previously. We also regularly review our recruitment and progression policies to ensure they reflect the communities we serve and operate it, um, within. Um, and actually, if I speak to gender, which is, I suppose, where I've had personally a lot of passion, um, actually, you know, we're driven to create the opportunity for women in particular to succeed and be heard through our industry leading policies. So policies have a massive uh, part to play. And when I'm like, talking about creating opportunities for women, it's not just around you know, we do have sort of break the maternity policies and parental leave in particular. But when you think about parental leave, what that does is gives men the permission to also be part of the solution. Because if we have men that will stay at home, look after their kids, so the woman can, you know, spend some time, more time in the workplace, that balance is created where there's an equal opportunity. I think the policies have got ways to really support women when they're outside the work, but then come back to where they can flourish and progress, um, which is really important as well. And, you know, creating that equity in the home uh, is really important. And, you know, I can probably stand here and say it's very similar to what's happened in our home where my husband, you know, takes a disproportionate share now of the household chores, looking after my children, our children. Um, so I can turn up and be the best I can be in terms of what I want to do and succeed at work. So I think that that equity in the home is really important. Um, and then for senior appointments, you know, when we're considering succession, Going back to, I suppose, what my first point was, just having that balanced list of candidates, um, making sure that you're, you know, looking at all the, all the representation and where you're trying to get to in terms of your goals is definitely um, critical when you're looking at how you're progressing in the organisation. So that's kind of one way in which we kind of look to take bias out the system um, and some interventions, you know, and, and pretty simple ones you can make in terms of recruitment and then I suppose on the other side, which is policy. So the next um, bite-sized chunk, I'll call it, is, is about making it inclusive and not just diverse. So it's interesting, you know, I think we've really focused um, and I think quite successfully so far in terms of, you know, the, the count and the numbers on diversity, making sure that we've got a diverse, um, a diverse agenda in, in terms of creating that and shifting the dial. 
but I suppose, you know, and one of the things I've kind of been learning a lot about is inclusion, which is the other side, which I don't think is as spoken about um, and is as hard and tangible measures as maybe creating that diverse um, change. And so what is inclusion is always the question. And I, I tend to summarize it as being invited to the table. Um, you feel safe, which is a massive part of a psychological safety. And when you feel safe and welcome, and then this part about allyship, and then you're brought into the conversation where you're celebrating distinction rather than celebrating sameness. And I thought that was a really nice way of kind of talking about, well, what does it really take? Um, and you can tell I'm passionate about it because I, I, I now stop myself to say, are we bringing people in? Are we creating a space where people can disagree? Are we, are we creating a space where we've created that diverse group of people but actually we're only, we're only tangibly taking action on the things that people are agreeing on because it's, it's, same, it's the sameness. So we won't get the, the benefits of having that diverse um, population and, and, and group until we really work on the inclusion. And it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard because you have to work on it and you have to be mindful. Another part of it is about sort of also when you think about accessibility, um, when you think about disability, and actually, there's a, there's a part around designing and adapting our places of work to be fully accessible. So working on creating a good accessibility and not just, you know, not the physical workspace, systems as well, if you think about it, our workplaces, and having guidelines to ensure accessibility in IT, recruitment, communications, and workplace design. So it's not even just about the conversation, it's about the, the space in which you can um, get people to bring their best to every day so that we get the benefit of having that diversity in our workforce. We've also built um, great employee support networks um, that meet the needs of the workforce and help to build awareness and understanding, which is again, you know, it's kind of unlearning and relearning. What's required here? What do we need to, to, to be aware of? What do we need to understand? Um, and so we've got an empower network um, for race. We've got a gender network called Unity. We've got a disability uh, network as well. Um, an LGBTQI plus network as well, which has done some amazing um, programs in terms of really upskilling and creating that awareness and understanding around these groups of people and what's required to really shift the dial, um, but also create an inclusion where we can have sometimes difficult conversations um, and get uncomfortable so that we can be better. Um, so yeah, so I think there's a lot to do in terms of being inclusive and not just diverse. Um, and there's a few ways in which, you know, we've tried to make some differences uh, and create that change. Um, but also just, you know, making sure that you're asking yourself those questions every time you're turning up to the table. Am I make, making people feel safe, welcome, brought into the conversation? Am I celebrating distinction and rather than celebrating sameness? So a good question to ask um, yourself and your organization as you move through this kind of journey. I suppose another chunk, uh, a third chunk is being better. And this is a big one around really, you know, I suppose it's a bit of an inner compass, being ready to unlearn. Um, and so one of the things that, um, so I'm on the Unilever UK and Ireland board. Um, I have been for the last four years. And one of the things that we've done as a leadership team is complete unconscious bias training so that we're working on ourselves. Um, and so we went through an intensive week long. Um, so there's a commitment in time um, training. And a part of this was around bias, you know, historical and learned. And it's uncomfortable because you think, oh no, look, I'm not like that. Like, you know, and it, and it, and it makes you look at yourself and say, well, what, are, what am I bringing that holds me back in sort of opening my mind? What behaviors do I need to unlearn? And actually, you know, for, for a rather senior group of people um, with a lot of history in terms of, you know, operating and working in different environments, there is still a lot of bias that's brought to the table. Um, so we did a kind of real hard reflection um, and, and had some coaching and support to really say, you know, what's our biases that we take in? How do we address them? And how do we stop and look in the mirror? Um, but also, I suppose, is a balance that, you know, just going through and talking with people that are having different experiences than us, creating that empathy and awareness so that, you know, yes, we have our own experiences, but if we don't walk in other's shoes for a, for a moment, 
um, and understand, then also, you know, you can't actually break your bias down. Um, so education is critical. Really working on your awareness, really working on your empathy to break bias down and address it and actually call it out, um, you know, is, is a big step, big step that each and every one of us um, really needs to do. And that's just education and learning and taking time to do it because you care. And you know that in the end, it's better for everyone if you, if you take those steps. The other part of being sort of being better is really becoming an ally. And I spoke a bit about sponsorship earlier. Um, and I think sponsorship is, is critical. Um, and, and allyship is here. So speaking up, inviting people in, you know, being an ally so that you're ready to, to step up. Because sometimes when it's not safe enough, or has never been done before, it feels uncomfortable, or it's always always been done that way before. So I think also um, making sure you've got some allies in the in the business, or you make a program around it. Um, so there's a person that brings people into the conversation, creates space to be heard, um, is critical to to unlock the inclusion and not just have the diversity. So we need, you know, we need to create that environment to really flourish. So I suppose the question I'd leave with you is, uh, who are you an ally for? What do you believe in? How are you going to step up? Um, and if you feel like you're not in a safe space and you're not getting the, the time um, and you don't have the sponsor, you know, make, making sure that you get that allyship and that sponsorship because there's no reason why a company shouldn't be supporting that. I suppose the next one is really getting external. So I think the biggest learning for me is partnership because if, a, if an organization is just trying to do it on their own, there won't be a, a good and lasting uh, impact. So I'll just share a couple of examples of that. Um, so we worked with Adjust, which is um, a, 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 a provider who, look, who works with disabilities. And so we hold neurodiversity training and workshops for our managers across all our sites um, with the aim to ensure all, of, uh, all employees with dyslexia, ADHD, autism, dyspraxia are fully supported with their needs and, and they're understood and catered for. And then, you know, more, more broadly, and, and I suppose from a, a global agenda on the um, 19th of June, our CEO, Alan Joe, signed the Declaration of Amsterdam, which is a global statement of support for LGBTQIA plus rights. And we have joined Open for Business, a coalition of leading global companies to show we mean absolute business on taking action on LGBTQIA plus inclusion globally. And then we work with Stonewall um, across UK and I, where we've audited all our policies and procedures to benchmark how we're progressing on inclusion in our workplace. So partnerships is critical um, because you're one, you'll learn, two, they'll help you really look in the mirror, and three, um, I think collectively we need to make a difference. And I think um, making those commitments with partners is really part of that process. Two more to go, and then I'll be open for questions. <laughs> um, and I suppose the last thing is. If you look inside your organization, you need to say, well, what do we have in our, in our arm and our artillery to, to accelerate change? Um, and the great thing about Unilever is we've got fantastic brands. And so actually speaking to consumers is a way which we can make a difference. Um, so we are always looking at what more we can do to leverage the power of our brands to be anti-racist through their own purpose and campaigns. So we can help build a world where, where racism is, is just not accepted. Um, and Lynx has been a huge platform for which we look at how we um, ensure we've got no anti-racist support. And we've got a good diverse reflection of, of the, um, the countries that we serve. And we also, we have used our brands to drive industry change in marketing um, by demanding change in representation, both on screen and off screen. So behind the camera and in front of the camera. Um, so we only work with partners and agencies who share the values um, and ensure we unstereotype 100%, not, not, not 50, not 60, but 100% of our advertising. Um, and look, we've got some beautiful brands with great examples of this, with Dove Positive Beauty, which really celebrates all forms of beauty, with Sure Move and the latest campaign we've done there, which really celebrates um, disabilities and being able to move no matter what. Um, who you are and what you're doing. And then also lo locally in Ireland with Hazelbrook Farm, we've had a long-standing partnership through HB with DSI um, Down Syndrome Ireland actually for the last 18 years, 
where we've um, done pet promotions, where we've been able to really give back to that charity and, and create change um, and acceptability. And so I suppose the last piece is back to kind of the goals, which is you kind of got to do your best, know your under, so know your numbers. Um, and so a big thing that we've, we've shared um, internally is, because it has to start within, is, is called Count Me In, which is actually for us to just understand what's the makeup of our current uh, workforce. And so we're really working on getting a better understanding of that because it has to be people feeling safe in order to share who they are and, and um, to get us get a representation of our population. But I think the one area where I think there's proven success is definitely in gender balance, where we've had this sort of 50-50 gender balance and managerial roles since 2017 across UK and I, and then achieved this globally last year. Um, however, there's still more to do. Um, we've got representation at other levels of the business in terms of senior and leadership roles. We've still got more to do then. And then particularly in finance and, and STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and, and mathematics roles. Um, but I think, I think the point I'm making really is that if 10 years ago, you never didn't say they would seek to achieve 50-50 gender balance at managerial level. I'm not sure we would have got there. So there is an importance in having goals, being measurable um, and, and chipping away and, and making those moves um, towards achieving them. It's, it's really critical. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, that's probably the last bucket. Um, so hopefully within each of the six areas, there's something new for you to adopt, um, drive within your own organisation so that it really helps us all move towards a world that is really fairer and more inclusive. Um, and I don't think, think the job will ever be done, but we can definitely get parts in which we can move uh, further towards that. So, yeah. Thank you. And you know, to create a just and more um, inclusive um, society, and also with the space um, and removing biases from the recruitment process is also one of the key things that I think most companies should also be able to adopt. And it's an easy thing to do, really, because representation is really, really important, especially within the recruitment level as well. Um, and I suppose one of the things that most companies tend to focus on when, for, when talking about EDI is they focus more on the gender, the race, nationality, and also ethnicity, uh, but there is less focus on the men mental health and people mm. from socially, socioeconomically disadvantaged areas. Um, so what is you know, Unilever's take on that? Um, what's Unilever doing to include people from different walks of life? Yeah. I mean, look, um, I think maybe in, in the past, I think it's just, you know, making sure that when we do the recruitment, we make sure that we're going out to a broad connection of, and base of recruiters to make sure that we're taking every and any type of opportunity to come our way. I think also we worked with an actress in the, part, in the past, which is a great way to, to leverage, I suppose, younger talent that's coming through. Um, and in the UK, um, we've worked with Amos Bursary, which is um, a, a great source of different type of talent, um, rather than, I suppose, just standard kind of universities as well. Um, but I think it's important when you're bringing people into the business that you, you have a broad network in which you're going to, to, to bring different people in. Uh, and then you've got a process which celebrates the fact that they haven't been to a certain university, that they've got different background and experiences. And actually the questions you ask linked to those competencies and what the people can bring to, to create that diversity of thought, right? Which is what we need. Um, so that's probably one part. I suppose, I suppose on the, the mental health and well-being part, I suppose what I can talk to is what we do, I suppose, inside Unilever in terms of mental health and well-being, um, because it's such, I mean, again, it's a huge, <laughs> a huge topic, um, but so critical and particularly, look, and just reflecting on where we are, you know, sort of back working from home again in totality, and what people need. And we were just having a discussion this morning around what do we put um, around people to make sure that they su can succeed, right? And then also there's no stigma. Um, so we have um, we have a, a helpline which we um, have access to and that's fully paid for by the business. We've got Time to Talk, which is actual men mental health trained professionals in our business that are available to talk to in a, in a private and confidential way. 
And I think there's this actual, there's a conversation, which is really important because taking the stigma away from mental health, you know, if I broke my arm and I had a cast on, no one would think any different. But if I have, you know, serious um, challenges where my mental health is impacted, it shouldn't be looked at any different. So there is also a, a piece around, you know, how to ha handle that, the stigma and ensuring that, you know, we, we put the right things around people so that we can have the conversation and we're educated in the right way. So I think there's probably a bit on each in terms of the balance. Um, I think one of the questions that just came up is that in a period where women's rights around the world seems to be going in reverse, what do you think should be done to promote female leaders and what should be done to protect gains in legislations in Western democracies? Yeah. Look, um, I feel so passionate about this area and um, yeah, we don't want to regress, we'd like to progress, right? <laughs> um, but I, I think I, I'll just talk about me personally, but um, I, I always say if you can't see it, if you can't see it, it's hard to believe. And I actually even seek out personally women um, to, to see like, oh, they've done it so I can do it too. I think examples of progress, I think speaking out, I think having these conversations that we're having today means that we're taking this seriously. And then back to, I suppose, the point I was making on, does every business and, and every you know, government, what are the steps that we're taking to ensure that we shift the dial? Because it takes time. Um, so I think as long as we're progressing forward and then, you know, it's, it, there's this transformational things that need to, need to be done. So this equity um, of policies. So I think businesses have got a part to play so that you create the space for women to, you know, take those opportunities is really important. And also having that dialogue at home, like I've had with my husband around, you will do some more dishes, you have got to look after the kids and take them to school so I can live my purpose and, and you know, turn off and, and be a leader in business, which I absolutely am passionate about. So I think these are things in, in terms of on all fronts that we need to do. Um, I also think sponsorship is critical. Um, I have a sponsor, it's a man. Um, and I know that if I, you know, I need to put that around me so that I get, I get a voice where I'm not there. And I think having that allyship and that sponsorship, a voice that can speak for you, that's supportive of you is also absolutely critical because otherwise we will regress because this is not a one-time thing, this is a progression. Um, and so that has to be systematic as part of the way um, we support each other. And businesses, if they really, really wanna commit and make a difference, they will invest in that. Um, I think one of the questions says that um, in Unilever, EI is defined as equity, diversity and inclusion. In many cases, the E stands for equality. Is there any difference between the two concepts or goals? Sorry, can you say the last part? Um, is there any difference between the two concepts, equality and equity? Well, I think we have to work on equality and then the equity comes as part of that. So I don't know, it's a chicken and egg, isn't it? So I think we seek equality, right? And then as part of that, we get the equity. Um, because then there's a there's this balance, but I think it goes back to that. And it, it's all connected, isn't it? Because actually what comes first? Actually, I think inclusion comes first. And I know that's a really hard one. It's harder to measure, um, but you can bring, you might say, okay, I brought everyone to the table. I've got a diverse group around me. Um, I believe there's equity in the group around me, but if there's no inclusion, then the rest is just, it's just a number. It's just what you brought to the table, but you're not really harnessing any power in the rest. So um, not to split the question around, but <laughs> inclusion is number one for me. Um, and we can debate, you know, we can debate what, what the definition is, but um, I think that's critical. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that one. Um, so what are the long-term consequences if we ignore EDI, considering, considering the recent growing far-right attitude and the global political climate, such as Brexit or President Trump getting into office? Getting out of office, right? Now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, I'm best not to um, probably have any sort of political uh, views at this point. Um, but look, I didn't go into the business case um, for for EDI because I just I truly believe that 
oh, a bit like climate, right? If we don't make systemic change and difference in this area, um, we won't get great innovation. Um, we won't get a culture which brings diverse perspectives to the table, which, which you know, serves our population, our people and our countries in the best way. Um, you know, an example is, you know, making sure that, you know, when my kids are watching TV, they see a representation of people on that screen that's representative of the people that are around them. Um, and so there's a fairness in that, which is so important because, you know, going back to what you see is, you know, should be reflective of the world we live in. Um, and in the end, I think to make the changes that we want for our planet and, you know, back to our, our Unilever's goal to make sustainable living commonplace, um, if we don't build up that, you know, to, back to the prior question, that the equality and that the opportunity for all people, then we won't have a we won't have a great society around around us, and we'll have other challenges, which you know um, won't be good for our planet and our society in the main. So I know that's a kind of a high level answer, but it, you know I think the business case, you know, from a business perspective, we should get better financial outcomes and better innovation and outcomes and serve the nation better. But from a global perspective, you know, um, making sure that we give people fair and, and and great opportunities so that they can better their lives um feed their children you know it's as simple as that i think we have a social responsibility to do that um yeah uh you mentioned quite a lot about you know women leadership and making sure that women are presented at all levels and how do you see the role of men in supporting women um to reach equality um i think it goes back to um so a couple of things. Um, well, I suppose one thing I, I think will make the difference in the main is, is really around the sponsorship. Um, the sponsorship and then, the, and then this kind of support to make the choices that you can to create the space in, in your life so that if you want to go higher, you've got that support system around you. Um, so I think having, having sponsors in the business is really important. And then what I found works for me is being really clear on what you want. Um, so I'm a mum, I have two kids and a husband. <laughs> so not three kids, but <laughs> two kids, yeah. Um, and I want to be a great mum. It's really important to me. But I also want to be a great um, business leader. Um, and actually, a lot of the time, I don't think, oh, I'm female, so it's different. Um, but it is. Uh, and actually, when I walk into a room, there's not many people, um, you know, that, you know, it doesn't feel as comfortable maybe as it should. So um, yeah, sponsorship is key. And then having the conversation well with yourself <laughs> and with your team at home to make sure you create the, the space um, so that you can thrive and succeed and being clear about what you want. I think those are the three things that have worked so far for me. And then I, you know, in terms of sponsorship, what I see is working in terms of what companies can do um, to make sure that it's, there's, there's progression because there is still that gap. Um, I'd be wrong for me to say, well, there wasn't still a gap. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think just also being able to create a safe space where such conversations are able to happen mm -hmm. about the inequality is a, a very good place to start and ensuring that all voices are heard um, is very important. Um, so do you or did you find any pushback within the Unilever, Unilever company to the idea of embracing EDI as a corporate commitment? And what would be your advice to people in other companies who would worry about such objections and how should they tackle them? Okay, so this is kind of three questions. <laughs> so let me take, <laughs> be honest with the rest. Um, look, no, um, uh, hopefully the context at the beginning shows that, and look, if you go to the Unilever website and download our, our social commitments, it's, it's there and, and published. So it's, you know, we've made very bold external commitments in this space. Um, and it's, we take it very, very seriously. So um, no, there is absolutely no pushback at all. But I do think that it does require everyone in the organization to play a role in it. Um, because, yeah, I can play my role, but actually what we need is more people to say, well, what can I do? Which is why I tried to give you the sort of bite-sized chunks around what you could do as well. Um, but, yeah, we have a, an EDI board that meets every quarter, which is a, a representation, a smaller representation of, of our board. And we have, um, we have networks, which I also mentioned 
which play a massive role within the business. Um, and, you know, I, I'm actually, you know, in awe of some of, you know, what, what those groups are doing. And there are all levels of the business, by the way. It doesn't, you know, there needs to be a leadership role in terms of senior people taking a stance. But actually within the business, you know, we've got graduates that are just so passionate about it and they're bringing conversations to the table. They're making us senior people get really uncomfortable having conversations. But this is what, what is required because I genuinely believe um, we've set a tone and we've set a commitment, which has then mobilized people within it to say, yeah, I've got something to say and I want to make a difference. Um, so, yeah, no doubt that Unilever is fully behind this and, and no, um, no requirement to make it happen on, on one side. Now, help me with the other two parts of the question. <laughs> um, let me just quickly check again. It was, what would be your advice to people in other companies who would worry about such objections and how should they tackle them? Yeah. Um, look, I think different, different companies are at different stages, aren't they? So um, I think a good place to start was always, and again, you have to think about who are the stakeholders that you need to have this conversation with and where's a good place to start to just open it up um, and have a dialogue. So, you know, I think there's, you know, if you looked on any website, um, there's a business case for EDI. and i So, um, and if you can't find one, reach out to me and I'll help you. Um, because there's actually, there is proof and statistics, and I didn't share all those with you today, um, but there's statistical evidence to show that this is good for business. So if people want to grow their business, which they normally do, if they want to have good thinking and innovation uh, and, a, and a future and forward-looking culture, um, you know, there is facts and evidence that, that point to that this this is critical and then I suppose you've got to start somewhere so what's the one commitment or what's the one place that you would want to start and will make the biggest difference that's aligned to where the, the corporate values are uh, in your company and I think if you start to join those things together and then create a dialogue I don't think people would say I don't want to listen um, so I think you just have to start somewhere um, yeah, I think just one last question before we wrap up, um, and this is a bit off topic, um, it's more on the ESGs, and I mean, just COP26 just ended um, a week ago, and um, all these major companies have their ESG sustainability reports out already, Unilever also has their report out, um, and you know, Unilever works with big brands, international brands. And um, so in September 2021, Unilever asked suppliers to slash emissions in half by 2030. Um, can you update us a little bit more about Unilever's environmental targets? Yeah, we've got loads. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have them to hand, so which is helpful, right? Um, yeah. No, but look, I, I suppose what I did today was focus on so I talked about three pillars. One was improve the health of the planet. The second was improve uh, people's health, confidence, and well-being. And then the third was contribute to a fairer and more socially inclusive world. Um, and within the third pillar was the equity, diversity, inclusion, which I kind of talked about, you know, what are our goals within those? Um, but under, I suppose, um, when we're talking about COP26 and the health of our planet, you know, we have climate action, protect and regenerate nature, and then a waste-free will, which is the kind of um, underneath the improving the health of our planet. Look, I'll give you a couple of the, the goals in which we're um, working towards. You know, we want zero emissions in our operations by 2030, zero emissions. Um, we will half greenhouse gas um, impact of our products across the life cycle by 2030. And we've, we're, we're on our way to, to achieving those targets. But, you know, 2030 is not that far away as well. So every year we've got a program in place which reduces that. Um, and replace fossil fuel uh, derived carbon with your renewable or recycled carbon and all our cleaning and laundry product formulations by 2030. And look, I'll just try and give you a real example under that one, which is, so all our personal products, so that's one of our brands, um, for those that like to do lots of washing at home. <laughs> um, well, we all need to do it, right? So all our personal products now have got 100% plant-based formulation. So that's taking out any of the carbons and replacing with all plant-based. So that's a good example of making our commitments real and tangible. And so when you go to the shelf and you're making a choice, plus they're on 100% recyclable bottles. 
that's actually making sure that we're living, you know, what we say. Um, and I suppose an example of bringing that to life. So, yeah, uh, more to do. And, you know, not that far to 2030. So, yeah, we've, got, we've still got more work to do. Yeah, there is a lot to do. Um, but thank you very much for your time. I think we've come to the end of this event. Um, but thank you very much for your time and for sharing so with much. us what Unilever is up to in terms of building a very inclusive um, society and also creating a very inclusive and a safe space, workspace. Um, and I do hope that, you know, everybody who attended to learn for one thing or two and managed will be able to sort of also create a safe and inclusive workspace, whatever they live. Um, and just to wrap up, uh, we will be having Task's 20th annual lecture, which is on the 7th of December. Um, this year's lecture will look at how civil society organization, whether in a fairly strong democracy like Ireland or elsewhere, need to respond to growing threats. So please do keep an eye out um, on our event event brand page as this will go live soon. Um, so thank you everyone for joining and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.